This weekend started with so much promise for the Orioles. Kyle Bradish flirting with a perfect game. Dean Kramer throwing a shutout. And then all it was was heartbreak on Saturday and Sunday as the Orioles split the four-game set with the Houston Astros. And I'll recap it all with my three big takeaways from the weekend. Coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles, your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, Orioles fans. Today is Monday, September 26th, 2022. And welcome back in to the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb. And coming up on today's episode, we're going to recap what was at one point an amazing and turned out to be a little bit of a disappointing weekend for the Orioles, where at the end of the day, they split a four-game set with the Houston Astros, and they win the season series, taking four of seven from Houston this year. But they had chances to sweep this four-game set and put themselves in a very good spot in the playoff chase and just were not able to do it. So I'll recap the series, get you my three big takeaways, starting with Dean Kramer's masterful shutout on Friday night. Then we'll talk about all the moving parts that went into Saturday's crazy game and finish off with Rubnet Odor making his last stand in an Orioles uniform here in September. But that's all coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. But before we get there, just did want to thank you for making Locked On Orioles your first podcast listen of the day. Locked On Orioles is free and available on all podcast listening platforms. And remember, we've got new episodes out for you Monday through Friday, all this week, all next week as the regular season finishes for the O's. Hopefully there's some postseason baseball to talk about as well. But even if there isn't, We'll still be daily throughout the MLB playoffs talking about the O's, talking about the MLB playoffs a little bit and getting you ready for what should be an exciting Orioles offseason as well. Make sure to subscribe, leave a five-star rating if you can, and like, comment, and subscribe here to the Locked On Orioles YouTube channel as well. And we thank you so much for making Locked On Orioles your first listen of the day. For your first listen today, we're talking Orioles and Astros, the four-game series Thursday through Sunday over the weekend at Oriole Park at Camden Yards, the final weekend series at the Yard here in the 2022 season. And the O's end up with a split. They take two out of four from Houston over the weekend. Of course, on Friday, we talked about the Thursday night 2 nothing win where Kyle Bradish was fantastic, eight and two-thirds scoreless innings to beat the Astros. The O's had much of the same on Friday night. Dean Kramer... A complete game shutout. The Orioles won the Friday game 6-0. And then the O's had multiple chances to win the Saturday game. Just couldn't do it. Lost a wild one, 11-10 on Saturday. And then, frankly, they had a chance to win Sunday's game in extra innings as well. Couldn't come through. Lost 6-3 on Sunday in 11 innings. And are now 79-73 and on the season with just 10 games remaining. The Orioles, after a weekend that saw a four-game series be split between Toronto and Tampa Bay, and then Seattle lose two of three to the Royals, including the Royals getting a 10-run inning on Sunday to come back and beat the Mariners. Shout out to Kansas City. The Orioles, with 10 games remaining, heading into play Monday, sit four games back of the Mariners, four and a half games back of Tampa, and six and a half back of the Toronto Blue Jays. But going to get you my three big takeaways from this weekend series for the Orioles against the Astros. My first big takeaway goes to Friday and Dean Kramer was the best Dean Kramer we have seen of him at the big league level. Kramer throws his first career complete game shutout on Friday night as he shuts down the Astros in a 6 nothing Orioles win in that one. Nine scoreless innings, just four hits allowed. He struck out six, walked only two, and allowed only three hard-hit balls, throwing 106 pitches to get the shutout, lowering his ERA to 3.07 on the season. What an incredible bounce-back year for Dean Kramer. And this was, I think, pretty obviously the best start of his career, but not just because of the surface numbers, the nine shutout innings. The underlying numbers, well, they were all some of the best of his career as well. And we got to start with the pitch mix 
for Dean Kramer. And he had, he had 15 whiffs in this game, a season high on 52 swings. But it was so interesting with how he mixed his pitches. He threw five different offerings in this game, which he's been doing over the last month and a half or so since he added his sinker. And his four-seam fastball was his least used pitch on the night. You rarely see that happen. I mean, maybe you see a knuckleballer use his four-seamer last. That's about it among starting pitchers, guys who have at least three pitches that includes a four-seamer. But Dean Kramer threw 29 cutters, 27 curveballs, 21 changeups, 16 sinkers, and 13 four-seam fastballs on the night and just absolutely dominated. He was, let's start with the cutter. It's been his most used pitch pretty much the entire second half of the year. He just poured that thing into the strike zone, got four whiffs on it, got a game high seven called strikes on it, got three foul balls. They were putting the ball in play, a lot of weak contact on that pitch, a 38% called strike and whiff percentage for Kramer on that cutter, which again, it's not exactly his swing and miss pitch, but it's his get me over pitch. It's his go-to pitch. It's getting better and better. And it was cool to watch on Friday. But maybe the coolest thing was Kramer's number two pitch. I mentioned 27 curveballs on the night. The most curveballs he has thrown in any start this season. He got seven whiffs on 16 swings on the curveball. Seven whiffs was best of any pitch in this one. And it wasn't his usual get me over curveball. He actually didn't get any called strikes with the curve, but it was the swing and miss pitch, which we basically haven't seen Kramer use the curveball as the swing and miss pitch at all, basically since he came up at the end of the year in 2020 and he threw a lot more curveballs when he first got to the big leagues. But that pitch, it was the best it's been all year by far. He threw it the most, it looked the best, and it was a perfect combination for Dean Kramer with that big 12-6 curve. And then comes the pitches that he's been working on all year. Now, the changeup has always been in his repertoire, but it was always by far his number four pitch. He would throw it three, four, maybe five times per start. Just sprinkle it in there if he felt like he needed to change things up. But he throws 21 changeups, third most used pitch. He gets three whiffs. It was in the strike zone. It tails away from lefties. It's looking nastier and nastier in every start. And it's just another weapon for Kramer. And then you talk about the sinker, a pitch he didn't even have until about four or five starts ago. And it was actually interesting to hear him talk with Scott Garceau and Jim Palmer on the Masson broadcast after the game, after the win on Friday. Jim Palmer asked him about adding that sinker to his repertoire. And he just talked about how he was talking with pitching coach Chris Holt and bullpen coach Darren Holmes. And they basically thought that, you know, and agreed that he needed a pitch that he was able to kind of jam in on right-handers and get some soft ground balls against right-handed hitters. He felt he was getting those soft grounders with his changeup against lefties, but he couldn't quite get it against righties and wanted a pitch to do that. And sure enough, here comes the sinker. He pours it in the zone. He gets three ground balls with that sinker alone, including the final outs of the game with a good sinker. He was just dominant. And really, the four-seam fastball, it was a get-me-over pitch. He threw it 13 times. He got four called strikes. It was 94 to 95, and it was just kind of, hey, I need something in the strike zone. Let me throw a four-seamer. But he was working everything else on Friday night. And again, if you think about where Dean Kramer was last year, you know, Barely made any starts in the big leagues because he was so bad. He was getting lit up at times in AAA last year as well. To now be what I think, you know, I said for a while this year that Tyler Wells was the best Orioles starter. And I think at times Jordan Lyles has been that too. But right now, if you were to ask most Orioles fans, I think they would all say that the best season by an Orioles starter this year with 10 days to go has been Dean Kramer. And he capped it off with a, wonderful performance on Friday night in the Orioles win. It was the first Orioles complete game shutout, of course, since the John Means no hitter in Seattle back in May of 2021. And with Kramer going nine innings, Kyle Bradish going eight and two thirds the night before, and then Jordan Lyles throwing the complete game with one run allowed the night before that. It was the first time Orioles starting pitchers had gone at least eight and two thirds innings in three consecutive starts since September 26th, 27th, and 29th of 1995. 1995 was the last time that happened. It had been 27 years 
since Mike Mussina, Scott Erickson, and the other Kevin Brown did it back in the 95 season. Special, special pitching from the Orioles this weekend. And Dean Kramer was the best of them all. But the one game this weekend where the pitching didn't quite have the best stuff, especially out of the bullpen, was Saturday's wild 11-10 to 10 loss. They used a lot of relievers. A lot of guys struggled. And at the end of the day, that's why they lost a game despite scoring 10 runs. But many tried to pin the blame on Brandon Hyde for Saturday's crazy loss. But coming up next, I'm going to look into what really went into all of Hyde's decisions. He had to make a lot of managerial moves in that game. And even though some of them didn't work out, I felt like most of them in general were the right moves. He just didn't get the play on the field that he expected. So coming up next, we'll break down kind of the five biggest moves that Hyde made on Saturday, dive deep into why he made those moves and why they really could have worked out and what that means for Hyde, for the Orioles bullpen and this team moving forward. But first, the Orioles after this weekend definitely showed that they can compete with the big boys, but they're going to have to add a few more pieces to get to that next level next year. And if you are looking to add a few more pieces to your business, you want to head over to LinkedIn Jobs. Because these days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. You want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. They help find the right people for your team faster and for free. So you can create a free job post in minutes on LinkedIn jobs. It doesn't take any time at all. They've got simple tools like screening questions that make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience. So you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and who you'd like to hire. At LinkedIn jobs, it helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. So you can post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on MLB. That's linkedin.com slash locked on MLB to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. So the Orioles, they started off this series incredibly well. You know, they get eight and two-thirds scoreless from Bradish on Thursday night. They get nine scoreless from Kramer on Friday night. You're up 2-0. And then you go into the Saturday game, and you're already a little behind the eight ball because Tyler Wells is on the IL. You have to start Mike Bauman. We'll get to that. But The O's have a a big fourth inning. They get five runs. They take a 5-2 lead into the fifth. They go over to the bullpen, which is very well rested because you just had your last three starters go complete game, eight and two-thirds, complete game. You got one out from your bullpen in the previous three days. Everybody's rested. Let's go get them. Let's clinch a series and go up 3-0 on the Astros. But that didn't happen. A lot of guys struggled. It was a crazy game. You had a blown save, and the Orioles lost 11-10. to And a lot of people ran to blame Brandon Hyde for what happened on Saturday, saying he made all the wrong moves as the Orioles manager. Because I think pound for pound, he made the most just moves in general of any game he's managed, at least any game that mattered that he's managed in his Orioles career. And many wanted to blame him for this loss. But I took the other side here and I, I put a thread out on the Locked on Orioles Twitter page on Saturday night, go back and check it out about 10 tweets long, just really diving into each move he made throughout the nine innings in that game. And wanted to kind of build off what I said on Saturday night here, because I think Brandon Hyde, for the most part, made the right moves in this game, pushed the right buttons and just didn't get the result he wanted. And, and that's the thing here, because, you know, you can make a lot of comparisons between this game and there's really two games you can compare it to. I think one of them would be that crazy game against the Blue Jays a couple of weeks ago, the day after Labor Day, when you know Kyle Bradish only threw three innings and Brandon Hyde went to the bullpen in the fourth and the Orioles won that game. That was a gutsy move from Hyde and it worked. And then the other game I compare it to is July 5th, Orioles and Rangers. Orioles ended up walking off in that game. Remember Rugnet Odor hit the game tying homer in the ninth with two outs. That was a crazy back and forth game the entire time. Many pitching changes, lots of moves. Orioles won that game. Sometimes when you're playing the Astros, a team now with 101 wins, best record in the American League, and they've been to three of the last five World Series, the better team just beats you. And it's harder to beat the Astros than it is to beat the Blue Jays or the Rangers. And I think that's kind of some of what happened on Saturday night. The O's played a great game against a great team and just ended up one run short. 
But there were certain guys who obviously didn't perform in roles where it felt like they had a good chance to succeed. So I kind of picked out five spots in that game that I wanted to dive into. And the first one was many complain that Mike Bauman should have stayed in this game longer for the Orioles. Now to reset why Bauman was even starting this game. Well, Tyler Wells had to go, unfortunately, on the injured list, which is going to end his season. We saw Wells start the Monday night game against the Tigers. You know, another start back from the injured list. He threw 66 pitches, but he was not going. He only threw three innings. He walked three batters. He was charged with five runs. Something didn't look right for Wells. Well, they ended up putting him on the injured list with shoulder inflammation, and that is going to end his season. So unfortunately, no more Tyler Wells this year after a really good year. He said, you know, that he was upset. He was disappointed. He was happy. He pitched over 100 innings this year. But the O's would have liked him to finish this out. The O's would have liked to have him, but he had an oblique injury and just wasn't the same when he came back. Looks like, though, he'll be fully healthy for opening day next year. So the Orioles call up Spencer Watkins, bring him back after he was sent down after some rough starts in August to replace Wells on the roster. But they don't go with Watkins as the Saturday starter, which I was fine with. They choose Mike Bauman instead. You know, he's been better in his last couple starts. He's been solid when he's pitched out of the bullpen over the last week or two for the Orioles. So they go to Mike Bauman. But Brandon Hyde made it clear before Saturday's game that Mike Bauman was not built back up. He'd been pitching out of the bullpen for the last two weeks for the Orioles and had been pitching in one to two inning stints. He just wasn't ready to pitch deep into a game. And basically, Brandon Hyde didn't give him a pitch count, but you could tell it was probably somewhere around 60 that he was going to be capped off at. Well, look what Bauman does. Four innings, two runs, three hits, two Ks, two walks of Homer, 58 pitches. And I get, you know, two innings through four or two runs through four innings against the Astros. You feel pretty good about that, especially in a spot start if you're Mike Bauman. But if you dive a little deeper, Bauman had given up nine hard hit balls in four innings. He was getting crushed, and he was lucky that the only damage he had allowed was the two-run homer hit by Jose Altuve in the top of the third. He was very lucky that it was only two runs that Houston had gotten off him in those four innings. So once the O's got that big five-run fourth and took the lead, it was, I think, a pretty easy decision to go to the bullpen. Bauman wasn't built up. He wasn't prepared to go any deeper than the 58 pitches he threw. And again, you had a rested bullpen where the only reliever you had used over the previous three games was Felix Bautista for five pitches to close out Thursday's game. So everybody in your pen is rested. You need 15 outs with a three-run lead. You go to the pen there. I think it's an easy decision, especially with how good the Orioles' bullpen has been this year. I, I don't know how you question that decision. The second move I want to get to is who Brandon Hyde went to in the fifth inning. He turned it over to Joey Crable in the fifth with the Orioles leading five to two. And many said, well, Hyde's biggest mistake in this game was not, or was going to Joey Crable instead of another middle relief type. But I would argue that Crable was kind of top of the line for the choice there. And I could hear an argument that maybe you would rather go to a Jake Reed. I can, I get that argument. You know, he's got some, some interesting stuff. There were righties coming up at the bottom of the order. I could see Jake Reed there. I, I get that argument. Now, you're not going to go to Dylan Tate or St. L. Perez just yet and burn them in the fifth, or at least you wouldn't plan to. It felt like Joey Crable was the perfect guy to bring in. You have a three-run lead. You have the bottom of the Astros order coming up, 7-8-9 in McCormick, Dubon, and Maldonado, who are all righties as well against the righty Crable. And although Joey Crable has had his struggles, recently he was coming off a couple of much better-looking performances for the Orioles. So you're not looking for high leverage outs here. You're in a middle relief spot in the fifth inning, bottom of the order up. You're saying, Joey Crable, go out there and get us a zero. Even if you give up one, you give up one, but get us three outs and just get us to the next guy out of the bullpen. And I know Crable has not been as good lately for the Orioles, but Crable was great early in the year. And he's not one of Brandon High's top guys right now, but he's still a guy he can trust at least a little bit in this situation. I mean, you look at Crable's September so far. He had, before that outing, he had thrown seven games. Only two of them had he given up a run. So he was pitching a whole lot better recently for the Orioles. And so they go to him. I thought that was the right decision. And Crable just had absolutely nothing. He gets one out. He allows four runs on three hits, no strikeouts, and a walk. It only took him 14 pitches to just get obliterated out of that game. 
And I guess you could argue, well, they should have pulled Joey Crable earlier once he was getting hit around. I get that. But when you're giving up that many base runners in just 14 pitches, if you think about that inning, most of the base runners he allowed, except for the walk, were on, you know, had the first or second or maybe the third pitch of the at bat. And you're not warming up another reliever as soon as Crable starts the inning. You have trust in him to at least get three outs, even if he gives up a run. So then the bases get loaded, and then you think, all right, we got to get a high leverage guy up. So they get CNL Perez up, but Crable was giving up base runners so quickly, first and second pitch. Perez got to warm up before he comes into the game. So you had to leave Crable in there longer and longer. And by that time, it just didn't work out. And Perez came in and obviously a couple more runs scored against him, all charged to Crable. Now Perez had to come in and be a high leverage guy. And he got him out of it in only a 6-5 game with the Orioles trailing. But I think that was the big thing that put the Orioles completely off their plan on Saturday is Crable's just got to be better than that. In a pretty low leverage spot, bottom of the order up by three in the fifth. And he just melted down. Brandon Hyde can't expect him to melt down. And I get a lot of people are saying, oh, I knew Joey Crable was going to do that. Um, again, in September, five of seven appearances were scoreless. The other two, he gave up one run in two innings and two runs in another inning. So he hadn't melted down like that in a long, long time. So I don't know what made you think he was going to give up four runs and get one out. Just didn't work out. I think it was the right call. It just didn't work out. Third one I want to get to is bottom of the seventh inning. So, you know, the Orioles tie the game at six. They get a run to go up seven to six in the game. Ryan Mountcastle, big RBI single in the sixth. And then the rookie, Hunter Brown, comes out in the seventh inning. Orioles load the bases with nobody out, bottom seven. It's time to get some insurance runs, you know? You don't have a lot of relievers to go to. Let's pile onto this lead. And it just doesn't happen. Jorge Mateo strikes out. And then Brandon Hyde makes the right move. With Robinson Torino's coming up, he goes to Gunnar Henderson as a pinch hitter off his bench. Correct move there. Henderson grounds out to a force at the plate, just doesn't get it done. And then Cedric Mullins grounds out, and the Orioles don't get a run. So Brandon Hyde makes the right move to go to Henderson there. And because he goes to Henderson, he has to double switch. He keeps Henderson in the game. You know, Torino's comes out. You, you bring Adley in to catch at that point, and then you lose your DH, but you had to. Gunnar Henderson is the biggest upgrade in the world over Robinson Torinos with the bases loaded in a one run game and one out just didn't come through a little bit of a tough weekend for Henderson who had no for 13, but again, the right move, it just didn't work in that spot. Fourth move. I wanted to look at many had said, well, Felix, why they bring him in so early in that game, you, you get to the eighth inning, Orioles still leading seven to six. Dylan Tate had just thrown a scoreless seventh. And then Tate walks the leadoff batter in the eighth. Now he gets the next guy to fly out. But with one away, you have arrested Felix Bautista, who has gotten two innings multiple times, gotten six outs multiple times. He's gotten multiple five-out saves this year. And you think, you know what? Bautista had thrown five pitches since Sunday. He pitched last Sunday in Toronto, didn't pitch Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday. He throws five pitches to close out the game Thursday, and he doesn't throw Friday. So he's well-rested. You're thinking this is the best time for him to get a five-out save. And you go to him with one out in the eighth. He gets a strikeout. Then, unfortunately, leaves a splitter up. Guriel ties the game. But then he bears down, gets out of the eighth. And then the O's get the big homer from Santander. Two-run shot in the eighth, his second of the game. Gives you that 9-7 lead. You already have your dominant closer in the game. He was at about 15 pitches. You send him back out there in the ninth. Easy decision. And I get it didn't start off great. The single and the walk to start the ninth inning. Then he gets a pop-up on the first pitch. So it's first and second, one out. He's at 25 pitches and his command was not his best and his splitter was not at its best. But I would still ride with Felix there. And really in Brandon Hyde's mind and in my mind, Felix should have been good to go to get five outs. He was as rested as he's been all season. He's gotten five outs on less rest before this year. So I completely understand why you're going to your best reliever to get five outs in a gigantic game with playoff implications. It just didn't work out. Felix, maybe it was too much rest for him because of the terrible games against Detroit. He didn't get the pitch in. He didn't have his best stuff. His command was off, especially with the splitter, just kept leaving that splitter up. That led to the Guriel tying the game in the eighth. And that really led to the, you know, Kyle Tucker hit in the ninth inning that tied the game. You know, we had him one and two, just left a splitter up. And Tucker hits one to right field to tie the game. Just 
but you, you ride with your best guy there. And that kind of leads me to the fifth and final move is many said, okay, you take Felix out of the game. Why are you going to Jake Reed? Well, who else are you going to go to right there? I mean, the only argument is the, the, the two guys you basically had left. Well, you had four guys left in the bullpen after Felix. It was Jake Reed. It was DL Hall. It was Keegan Aiken. It was Spencer Watkins. You're not going to Spencer Watkins out of the bullpen. He hasn't pitched out of the pen basically all year. And you're not going to Keegan Aiken because he's been terrible. So you either have DL Hall or Jake Reed. And yeah, maybe you could argue that you bring in DL Hall against the lefty and Kyle Tucker. You don't let Bautista face Tucker. But Bautista had already struck out Tucker once in this game. And Tucker hits lefties just as well as he hits righties. He's not a splits guy. It doesn't really matter for him. So I'm still trusting a tired Bautista over Hall and Jake Reed at this point. And then he said, well, why are you going to Jake Reed, the waiver claim? He's really the only guy you go to there. Once Tucker got that hit, there were six consecutive righties due up in the Houston order. So you're going to go to Jake Reed, who gets righties out at a high, high level. That was the right move by Hyde. He made a good pitch. Yuli Gurriel fights one off to the right side. Nine times out of 10, that's a ground out to second that end the inning. But the shift is on, and it's just a little out of the reach of Rubenet Odor. And instead, it scores two runs, gives Houston an 11-9 lead. And that's your ball game right there. And it was just unfortunate for the Orioles because I felt like Hyde – made the right decisions. You could argue some other things, you know, should CNL Perez have pitched longer, you know, through I think nine pitches in the fifth inning. Yeah, I could argue that. Or maybe Brian Baker throws more than one inning like he did in Sunday's game. Yeah. Okay. You could argue that, you know, the Ramon Arias getting injured in that game definitely hurt him. They had a double switch. Then they had a double switch again and put McKenna in the game in the eighth. If they had not replaced Mullins with McKenna in that double switch in the eighth inning, Felix Bautista would have had to hit in the bottom of the eighth. That wouldn't have gone well. So you had to do that because Arias came out of the game. And so just a lot of moving parts. I don't think Brandon Hyde was perfect, but I thought he did enough to help the Orioles win this game. And at the end of the day, their players didn't execute against arguably the best team in baseball. And sometimes it just happens. Not everything is Brandon Hyde's fault. Again, he's not a perfect manager. He's made his mistakes this year. But I thought he handled this one pretty well. And the O's just didn't come up clutch and the Astros did because that's what they do. They're an incredible team. And it just happens sometimes. And unfortunately, that's what happened in the crazy game Saturday. But Rugnet Odor, he did his best on Saturday to try and get the O's, will them to a win. Had a couple of big hits in that game. And frankly, Rugnet Odor had a huge series this weekend against Houston. And after many thought that he was kind of done, including Brandon Hyde kind of saying he was done for the year, Rugnet Odor is having one final stand for the Orioles. And we'll talk about that coming up next. So the O's end up splitting this series with the Houston Astros, but Rugnet Odor did all he could late in the weekend to try and get the O's a series win and maybe even a sweep because they had a chance to win the Saturday and the Sunday games and potentially sweep the Astros. They would have been two games back of a playoff spot right now had they done that. But a good team got the better of them late in games, and it happens. But Rugnet Odor did everything he could to help the O's try and win this series. And it was so interesting to see Odor in that spot because my third and final big takeaway from the weekend is that Rugnet Odor is not quite yet to go away. Not quite ready yet to kind of slump back to a lower role on this Orioles team because Brandon Hyde said last week after he started inserting Taryn Vavra back in the Orioles lineup again, specifically last weekend in Toronto, that Hyde was kind of turning the page. He was, you know, going to see Rugnet Odor less and less. He said, Odor has been a great leader for our team, great contributor, but he's going to play less down the stretch. He said, we're going to get a look at some younger guys. The younger guy he meant basically was Taryn Vavra was going to get a lot more at bats down the stretch. And that seemed to be the plan throughout the week against Detroit and against obviously Toronto the weekend before. And then Ramon Arias comes up with an injury, has some back and neck spasms, has to be held out of the lineup. And lo and behold, you got an infielder out. Well, you got to go to the infielder on the bench. And that, of course, is Rugnet Odor. So he's thrown right back into the lineup against Justin Verlander on Thursday night. We talked about this. He gets the two-run single, ends up being the O's only two runs. They win it 2 nothing. And then Odor was out of the lineup on Friday. Arias was back in there, but Odor right back in there Saturday and Sunday. And he ended up having a huge series for the Orioles. Odor goes six for 12 with a home run, seven RBIs, and only one strikeout in the three games he played 
this weekend for the O's and had some gigantic hits. I mean, the guy had five of the biggest hits of the weekend for the Orioles. You ranked the top 10 hits this weekend by O's hitters. Odor easily had five of the top 10, maybe five of the top seven or eight. He gets the two-run single that ends up being the difference on Thursday. He has the two-run single in the fourth of the bases loaded off Framber Valdez on Saturday to open the scoring in the fourth. He has the solo home run in the ninth inning to lead it off on Saturday to try and maybe start another comeback that made it an 11-10 game. And then on Sunday, he has two gigantic game-tying singles. Hits one off the scoreboard in the eighth to tie the game at one, and then ropes one into right field in the tenth to tie the game at two and extend the game there. And he just had big hit after big hit. And for Rugnet Odor, who was productive and was certainly clutch early in the season, you know, already has the two walk-off hits for the Orioles, has multiple huge late game, eighth inning, ninth inning home runs this year. The clutch factor for him has been gigantic. And his numbers in those high leverage spots, according to fan graphs, I mean, it's been ridiculous. He, and this is coming into Sunday, this average went up because he got the two hits on Sunday, but Rugnet Odor in high leverage spots this season was hitting 327. He was hitting 185 in medium leverage and 184 in low leverage. That is ridiculous. To kind of combine it a little more, he had a 185 WRC plus in high leverage spots this year, 53 in medium leverage, 68 in low leverage. He continues to be captain clutch for this O's team. And it seems like he is not done yet. And it was nice to see him just be the guy who, you know, the O's are playing this great Houston team who Odor has seen a lot in his career. And it's this big spot with all these rookies. But Odor is that veteran, one of the only guys who has been in playoff chases and has played in playoff games on this team. And it's kind of felt like playoff games, especially this weekend against Houston. And he came up huge. And I don't know if this weekend is going to give him a lot more playing time. Might give him a little more. But I think the O's would still rather play Vavra and Arias if he is healthy. But if Ramon Arias is still dealing with this, you know, back and, and shoulder thing, which did keep him out of the game on Sunday... Odor is going to play, and right now, he's swinging the bat well in every spot, not just in the ninth inning, not just in extra innings. And you know what? It's been really tough to watch at times, but he's been playing a great second base defensively as well. And I hate to say it, but I think he's helping this team right now. And I wouldn't play him over Vavra, and that's what was so interesting. I mean, Tara Vavra was playing some left field this weekend, just so Rugnet Odor could be in there and be at second base because he was helping the O so much. And I don't think by any chance Odor will be a Baltimore Oriole in 2023. They got too many infielders ready to go and hopefully that they're signing in free agency to do that. But if he's got one last stand of hot hitting, especially in clutch situations left in him that he started this weekend against Houston, I wouldn't play him every day. I still want Arias in there and certainly still want Vavra in there to get these key at bats in his rookie year. But I'm okay still seeing a little more Rugnet Odor down the stretch because the O's, it's still a long shot, but they're still technically in it. And he's one of the only guys on this team that's been in it before. And he's showing here at the end of the year that he's still got a little juice left in him. And he is not quite ready to go to the back of that O's bench and just be a motivator and a cheerleader. He's ready to have big hits. And he certainly had some of them all weekend against Houston. But for Odor... The big hits were not quite enough to get the O's a series win. They split the four games with Houston. And again, go into the week, four back of Seattle, four and a half back of Tampa, and six and a half back of Toronto. Ten games left for the Orioles. Season ends next Wednesday, and they kick off a big series this week. Four games in Boston at Fenway Park against the Red Sox starts tonight. That's your last kind of bad team you play. I mean, the O's at least got to win three out of four. Basically, to stay in this race, they're going to have to sweep the Red Sox in all four games this week to put some pressure on the other teams. You got Toronto there at home for three against the Yankees. Yankees will be trying to clinch the division. Tampa has three in Cleveland, which you think would be a bigger series, but the Guardians actually just clinched the AL Central on Sunday, and they can't really get into those one or two seeds. So the Guardians are going to start resting some guys. So that could be an issue. And then Seattle, they've got three at home against Texas. You would think that's easy, but the Mariners have been playing absolutely awful lately. So nothing guaranteed for that team right now. Hopefully, the O's can beat up on a struggling Red Sox squad and get themselves a little bit closer 
in this race. But I'll be right back here with you tomorrow on the podcast. We'll recap game one between the Orioles and Boston, get you the five things you need to know from that one and get you all your updates on this Orioles playoff race as they are still holding on for dear life with 10 games to go. But that's all coming up on tomorrow's episode. Until then, I'm Connor Newcomb, and this has been the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team, every day.